Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down tools, toys and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David and in this episode we've got the nice 1989 Motorola Personal Digital Communicator and the HTC Wildfire from 2010-ish. Let's get on with the teardown. Okay, in the previous episode when we looked at some phones, we had the car phone, which was a similar kind of age to the Motorola. And we also had the Nexus 5, which was built by LG. And that was about three years after this. So you'll get an idea of how quickly things progressed between here and here. What is interesting though, is the other phone we had from 1989 was a car phone. Whereas this is a proper true portable mobile phone. I think we'll save this one for later. So let's put that to one side and get on with the HTC. Now this HTC was actually donated all the way from uh, Austria. Thank you very much, Clem. Always appreciate donations from other VCPs. And so this in 2010 was still very early in Android's life. Uh, the first Android phones had come out, was it two or three years earlier? And there was um, the HTC the HTC Hero, that was it, I think. And it was really, really defined by this kind of hockey puck shape. Um, and this one sort of still retains that a little bit. Uh, a lot of progress had been made, but it's weird to see an Android phone now with four physical or well, five physical buttons. Whereas these days they're all soft completely. The only thing you have is the unlock button, but progress, I suppose. So you've got nice battery. See, even back then, we already had micro SD card. Obviously, full-size SIM, something you don't see often these days. User serviceable batteries. Was it so bad? Yeah, I know it's nice to have an IP rated phone that's waterproof, dustproof, whatever, but the built-in product obsolescence really sucks. Just in case anybody didn't know, uh, the Android version names originally all started out with like sweets and cakes and treats like that, eclair, donuts, even as far as Oreo and Kit Kat, uh, because I think the original place these were developed had a bakery over the road and the names of those, so they went cupcake, donut, eclair, froyo, frozen yogurt, EFG, gingerbread, honeycomb, you get the idea, right? So they went through numerically A, B, C, D, E, and that's how you can sort of keep an ear out, keep an eye out for the version of Android you're running as well. Anyway, this came with Eclair, which was Android 2.1, which feels like a very long way away, a long time ago now. But there's definitely a lot that's still recognizable in Android, even between then and now. This corner is actually slightly looser than some of the others. Okay, bottom cover. Got a couple of contact points there and there. Nothing clear and obvious as what they might serve. I would have thought, oh, actually, I hold this moulding at just the right angle, there's kind of a, a ridge in it. So I wonder if this is actually one of the antennas, which is not dissimilar from what we saw in the Nexus 5. See, I'm pretty sure at this point it's kind of pry and lever. I just would like to do it without breaking anything unnecessarily. Also, micro USB. Isn't it nice to see a standardised fitting that stuck with phones until another standardised fitting, USB Type-C came along. Don't want to say I'm bitter, Apple. Okay. So that is just uh, the mouldings, the lens, what's the uh, back speaker, lens for the LED light. So I actually had an LED flash, nice touch. Some shielding, nothing too exciting there. Again, we've got another couple of contact pads up here, which would have made contact there and here. So on here we had Bluetooth 2.1, Wi-Fi G, I believe. Uh, obviously GSM, so mobile connectivity, but we also had AGSM, so assisted GPS. So he had at least four or five antennas in there. So had one, two, three-ish, four identified already. On the back here, we've got a load of RF shielding, which is weird because you don't tend to see that anymore on phones. Oh, actually, no, having said that, I'm pretty sure on the um, Nexus 5, we actually had the uh, sort of copper film taped on the back, which must have been serving a similar purpose. What's really cool is you see the little motor and the vibration. And it's just an off-center mass on a very small motor for vibration. That's pretty cool. Now we've got some more screws. What I'm not sure of is where the display, oh, there we go. T, 
two more connectors just there on the edge. Glad we took that carefully. So that's the main board. You see the SIM card She takes up an enormous amount of space on this PCB, both insertion side and on the rear. And what's also interesting is the fact we've got one, two, three, four different RF shields on here, which is only interesting because most of, uh, most of what goes into a smartphone now is integrated onto the system on a chip, the SOC. And that contains as much as physically possible to simplify and make the package size smaller. Are these RF shields, they look to the naked eye like they are just clipped on rather than soldered on. Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely just clipped on. And just in case it wasn't obvious beforehand, I think this one definitely calls for the microscope to come out. Okay, so this is removed. I don't know what this says about me, but we've got a Qualcomm chip right there, and I'm pretty sure that's gonna be the main processor. Samsung, that's almost definitely gonna be the storage. Got another couple of Qualcomms. Um, don't know what they are, but we can look up data sheets. But yeah, there's a lot of discrete components here, and there's a very, very polished IC here, and it doesn't appear to have any markings on it. So we'll definitely do some looking up on that later. And then in the front, we have the TFT screen and the digitizer. Neither of which I'm all that thrilled about trying to remove, if I'm honest. For the sake of history, we'll keep that all together. So again, modern phone, not quite as rationalized down to one system on a chip and one storage chip like modern phones are, but you can definitely see the rationale of trying to condense everything down as small as possible. Low power, low energy, it's heading that direction. And it wasn't long until we got that system on a chip with everything integrated into it. So let's compare that to 1989's best. Oh, just look at it. So this one I know straight away isn't gonna work. It's got a nice nickel cadmium battery, which I wouldn't dare plug in. I'm sure that'd be uh, spontaneously combusting in a second if we tried to charge it. And also one of the contacts here out of the battery bay has just disappeared. I don't know if it got caught on this and escaped when the battery was being removed at some point or whether it's somehow got caught and pushed inside. Uh, at least we can eliminate that option in a little bit. One thing I do want to point out though is this. This is just a dumb indicator. So this means if you, for some reason, needed lots and lots of talk time, you could put three or four of these in your bag, and when they're empty, flick the switch, just so it shows this is a dead battery. You don't have to plug it in and try and turn your phone on. You know without plugging anything in. Nice little idea. Personally, I prefer to like some laptops, like having a little power meter on the side where you can press a button and it'll show the energy level. But yeah, that's, that's a hunking great battery, which was basically the size of the whole of this phone, or bigger than, look. You could have got two or three of these in that space. So hopefully everybody has watched and is very familiar with the, uh, the video of the car phone we did. If not, why not? Go back and watch it now, I'll wait. So this, this phone falls into that awkward category after there was some sort of international standardization on mobile communications in the late 80s where the dialing and connectivity was digital, but the actual talking was still analog, which is why you end up with that crossed wires, I can hear somebody else's phone call issue, because in theory, it was just analog and you could tune in without much effort. Now the trouble is, that was the only screw or fixing I found on the entire thing. Having a little look, and that means that now, I don't have a clue where to go. Yeah, I think that antenna casing is got to come off first. Don't know if that's glued in. No, just pressed on. Okay, well that wasn't pretty, but the back cover is off and it's relatively intact. I have cracked this bottom corner, unfortunately. But what I will say is the shielding, totally different concept. It's kind of this, like, I mean, it's just a plastic back shell, but they've got this copper coating painted on, sprayed on, and this little bit of plastic that jumped out while we were doing the disassembly appears to make up these sort of the, the gaskets, the contact points between this painted finish 
and the motherboard. And that will just place back on. You can see where there are slightly tarnished points all across here where all of these uh, little gasket parts make con good contact. Obviously we've got the nice sliding antenna. Ooh, ooh, oh my goodness, there is so much in this phone. So this display is actually very, very similar to the, or reminds me of the LED display that we saw in the calculator, the Texas Instruments TI-30 scientific calculator had a very similar LED display to this one. So at least you didn't have to drag around with vacuum fluorescent tubes in your uh, mobile phone. So that's a very well packed double-sided surface mount board. It's a huge custom connector for connecting to car phones. Oh look, okay, so this battery terminal, uh, that must have broken off while we were taking that out. So that would have placed just there. And obviously the one that was missing was this side, which makes me think that was definitely gone well before I got to it. There's no side of it inside, so it must have fallen out when it broke. Because this rod seems to be just plastic. We've obviously got this coil here, but there are no electrical, electronic connectors onto the main area. Was it a placebo or is there a metallic substrate in there that's uh, becoming a sympathetic antenna due to the induction at the bottom. So just up here when the antenna actually goes in, let's remove that straw through lack of a better description. Look around here, you can see all the temper colours coming out of the steel. Was this heated in situ after stamping or was this a result of use? I can't believe it got that hot. Yeah, so I originally thought that the keypad was just going to be a membrane keyboard which, you know, you would have kind of expected. All they had to do was put a bit of graphite on the back there, job done. However, I saw this, got excited thinking it was gonna be tactile switches, but it's not. These are blister domes. They're close to tactile switches, but nowhere near as good. Although the volume switches on the side, they are actually really low rise tactile switches. So with the power coming in here, guessing that's power management, looking at the traces, Makes sense, you've got battery positive that runs across here through a resistor, provides a positive plane all the way up there. I assume that's positive actually, does it say on here? Yeah, the one closest to the center is pos. And I'm pretty sure that center one would be an NTC uh, thermistor, just monitoring the battery temperature while charging. And then the negative on the outside, you can see it connects to a ground plane, which presumably floods that entire side of the board. So this is going to be the power management, I would have thought. Custom spun up ceramic coated because it's going to get nice and hot. Singapore. Now based on its position, I would assume this is RF modulation and demodulation. Which, if you remember on the car phone, were two separate, almost entire subsystems, which were then modulated back onto the antenna. But this appears to be just a single, well, a single encased RF shielded components however many there may be. And on the other side, we've got what I would assume is a load of digital communications to manage things like the LED displays, the dialing, which is all digital. And of course, this does have limited onboard memory, things like that, but most of which is things like redial, maybe a couple of dialing presets, which could probably be handled by uh, registers in a microcontroller, if that's what that Atmel IC is. Okay, well, here you have a really good demonstration of how we went from lots and lots of discrete ICs and very custom hardware, moving all the way through history and time and starting to diverge down to that really focused integrated circuit in ultimately ending up in a system on a chip that we saw in the Nexus 5. And this is a really good example of how quickly that changed amongst other things. I'm quite happy to tear down every phone I can lay my hands on. What do you think? What other phones would you like to see? Would you like to see the first iPhone versus the first Android phone? Would you like to see more phones from when Nokia went a bit crazy and started doing all their concept phones or the later Symbian phones when Nokia ruled the world? Let me know in the comments over on the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time.